Um, yeah, apologies everyone for the long title, so I shortened it here a little bit. So first I'd like to congratulate Ed Boyden for, uh, for the medal. So we, we've never met, I've never done expansion microscopy, read a lot of your stuff though, liked it. I'm going to talk about something a little bit different, I'm going to talk about actually getting structure, dynamic structure, so you'll see what that is about um, in a little bit, but let me start. I'm at the medical university, not the biocenter anymore. Um, and we do a lot more medical driven research now, so we actually have labs in the anatomy building, but we also have instruments in the hospital and we're really working on transla translational stuff as well now. So let me start. Yeah, I don't believe in atoms. So the idea here is we don't need atoms for a lot of things. And this is something that Ernst Mach said not so long ago. So this was 1897, and everyone thought it was about Made, it was an absolutely good statement, and everyone agreed with him. And he said this after a lecture by Ludwig Boltzmann, where he introduced, introduced his thermodynamics and statistical physics, um, just around the corner from here, so not far away from him. Um, so why did he say that? So there's two reasons. The first thing is that Ernst Mach was an empir uh, empiricist, so he needed to see something to believe it. So he wouldn't have believed in atoms till the 1950s. The second reason is that he didn't actually need them. So we know Mach from sort of jets going at Mach 1, Mach 2. Yeah, he studied hydrodynamics, continuum mechanics. So for him, atoms were just a useless thing that just made things complicated for nothing. And he also didn't like Ludwig Boltzmann too much. And Ludwig Boltzmann was just making everything super messy. But of course, Boltzmann needed atoms. So if he didn't have atoms, none of this statistical physics made sense. All the entropy stuff wouldn't make any sense. And in a way, why I bring this up is because in science, we're actually still there. We, you know, we're still in this argument. So especially working more in a medical field now, a lot of things we don't want to think of as atoms. But molecular medicine is, of course, an important thing. Um, and so really what we have is we have these two areas, these two very disparate areas, and all we're trying to do is trying to get at the middle. So for things to work, we need to understand it from a molecular mechanism so we can change it but we need to understand how something works on the whole. So I think um, what Johan and Ed do is, you know, you're climbing up this ladder to try and get to the, to the other side, but there's obviously this big thing in the middle, which is emergent phenomena, which is how actually structure and life actually happens. So what we do essentially is we just jump right in the middle and see what happens. So basically in the middle is where you have structure forming. This is where you have atoms forming structures, be it your body, be it anything else. Um, and actually forming life as we know it. And this is, of course, related to mechanics, fundamentally. So if you want to talk about structure, why does anything have the shape that it does, you need to consider its mechanical properties. So you can measure the mechanics of different tissue, and they all have different values. So there's a sweet little plot of just sort of people poking things and seeing that some things are stiffer than others. So this is just in kilopascals, basically a measure of how stiff different things are. And, but basically, this is... What I need you to understand is that mechanics are not that simple. So when someone says like, oh, this is so many kilopascals, this is so many kilopascals, that doesn't mean anything at all. That means something for one particular way that someone did something. So what we really think about when we talk about mechanics is something called viscoelasticity. So everything is elastic, so it has a certain stiffness, but it's also viscous to some extent. And depending what the viscoelasticity is, um, will also, the viscoelasticity itself will depend on a lot of different things. So it depends on the spatial scales that you probe. For example, if you have a solution with some suspension in it, if you poke the individual suspension, that'll be really stiff, but the solution as a whole is soft. So the scales are very important. The direction may be important if you have some structure. So you can imagine a lot of tissues are stiff in one direction or the other. The time scales are important. So the classic example here is even water. So you put your finger in it, it's soft. You jump from the top of a tower, it feels like stone. So the time scales are important. The boundary conditions are important. Can it move aside if you push it? And the strain in most materials are important as well. So basically, if you stretch something, it'll usually become less stiff as you stretch it more. So actually, just giving one number for stiffness is kind of useless. So actually, structure depends on a complex matrix, a tensor, which has a lot of components to it. OK, so imagine we have that. What do we do then? So we're kind of good at engineering. So we're really good at modeling stuff and doing things systematically. So this is what we normally do with engineering materials. We create this finite element mesh. We give each 
vertex a certain value of a, certain, of a stiffness tensor, or even just a single spring constant, and then we can model exactly what happens. We can model car crashes perfectly, and we can model how planes fly and so forth. The pro so what can we try and do with... Uh, so we try and do the same thing with biology. We try and basically re-engineer life. We create these same meshes, we put values in, and we see if we can predict how structure emerges on that scale. Now the problem here is a few things. Firstly, we're dealing with a mixed phase system. So I mean, we've got certain models, poor elasticity and so forth, that can actually deal with this. But we have liquids and solids, and that's not always that easy to deal with. A bigger question is actually, what scale do we do our meshing? So if we look, as we saw, if we zoom in more and more, we'll see more and more detailed structures. Eventually, we'll have to have some effective property. We can't sort of have an infinite mesh. The biggest problem, though, is that everything is changing. These are active systems, so the chemistry affects the mechanics, which affects the chemistry, goes back and forth. And that basically is a function. That's what we call life. Um, a secondary problem is that we also have so many different spatial scales and so many different temporal scales interacting. We have, the whole thing is non-local in, in a lot of ways. Um, so how do we even try and approach that? So ideally, we want something that can measure all of this at every vertex with absolute resolution at every time. So we can't do that. So we've got various techniques. I put them in separate boxes because they're all very different that can actually measure mechanics. So the most common one is probably atomic force microscopy, often called the gold standard of mechanobiology and biomechanics. You basically poke something and see how much it changes. Simple to interpret. Sheliology, you twist it, you see how much it sort of, you usually measure viscosity with that, but can also measure elastic properties. Optical coherence elastography, basically you just usually try to uh, put a puff of air or you just poke your sample and you see how an acoustic wave propagates and measure the scattering from that. Passive microbiology, so it's a shame Gerhard's not here to talk because he would have talked a little bit about that probably. You basically watch how molecules move and you track them, and from that you can work out what the viscosity is, but also the elasticity. Micropipette aspiration, a weird technique that's surprisingly popular. You basically suck a cell into a tube and see how it changes shape. You know what your pressure is, so you can model it backwards. Optical tweezers, active microbiology, you attach something to a bead, you move the bead optically, and you see how much force you need to move it, you can work that out. And the thing that I'm going to talk about today is something called brillant spectroscopy, where we basically use a scattering from um, inherent acoustic modes in a sample. So, and from that, from the speed of those waves, we can actually work out how stiff the material is. So to understand that a little bit and what it can tell us, let's just think about what we're measuring. So if you shine light at a sample, so here's just light shining at a sample, single frequency light at a sample, what we get back is we get back a lot of things. We might get back some fluorescence, some autofluorescence. So these are electronic resonant processes, spectroscopically not too interesting. Yeah? So they basically, if I change my wavelength by a few nanometers, I get exactly the same thing. So it's more of a resonant process. It can tell you some stuff, but it's less specific. Then you get also the Raman scattering signal. So this is vibrations from individual bonds, and this can give you a chemical signature of what's going on. This is not too hard to measure. It's a bit weaker than the fluorescence usually, um, but it can give you very specific information on what's there. The low frequency Raman or terahertz Raman, that's a little harder to measure. That's closer to the light that you're coming in, and that can give you more structural information. So these are bonds that move together, sort of collective vibrations, but really only a few of them, yeah? Um, and this can actually be stronger than the Raman signal as well. Um, but it's a little harder to measure still. Finally, you also get the brilliant spectra. So this is something that's really close to the light that you're shining in, and that's why most people don't measure it or see it or think about it. So it's basically, it's just less than a wave number away from the um, actual light that you're shining in. And these are peaks due to collective motions of all the molecules together. These are just due to sound waves that move due to the finite temperature of this world. And they are at all frequencies, they are at all wave vectors, um, but we scatter off a particular one depending on how we probe. So the thing to understand here is these are decreasing energy, so the brilliant signal is usually quite weak. Um, they're much slower, so these travel at 1,000, 2,000 meters a second, so basically the speed of sound. Meanwhile, of course, the Raman vibrations are femtoseconds, and they're extended. There's no, you can't really talk about single molecule brilliant scattering because you need thousands of molecules to actually get a wave. So what is it? So if I press this button, okay, let's try here. 
If I shine light to the sample, a single frequency laser, my sample, what I will get back is I'll get back the light scattered back as if it's a mirror. So the elastic scattering will just come back to me. So it's not necessarily the Rayleigh scattering, but the elastic scattering will come back. What I'll also see is I'll see two small peaks very close to this peak. Now, these one is slightly red shifted, one is slightly blue shifted. If your laser's messed up, you'll also see this. So this is a very tricky thing to see, and you need to make sure that this is actually um, something real. They shifted by a very small amount, and those are called the brilliance peaks. One is the Stokes, one is the anti-Stokes. So how do we understand this? Two things we need to explain this. Number one, light reflects from something if there's a change in optical density. That's why you see everything around you. Yeah? Or if you put a red light on, everything seems red because the red light scatters back. Molecules are not stationary. Everything's moving. Yeah? So it's easy to accept as well. Molecules moving. So, the, okay, this is just one particular frequency. Obviously, they're moving at all particular frequencies, but I'm just taking a, one particular spectral thing here. So the molecules are moving. Now I can draw a box around them. Yeah? You see the molecules are going in and out of that box. Yeah? So basically, the density, which is the number of molecules divided by volume, is changing. So they have a density fluctuation. Now, if I want, I can move this box as much as I want, so I always have the same number of molecules in it. Yeah? I'm allowed to do that. So basically, I could have density waves. <clears throat> so you will have density waves at all frequencies in your material. Now, light reflecting from a moving area of constant density. So you get a Doppler shift. So if you have something moving, just like sound scattering from it, light will scatter and be reflected and be shifted, depending on if it's moving towards you, blue shifted, red shifted if away from you, not shifted if perpendicular. So since the molecules are moving in all directions, that's exactly what we're looking at here. These tiny shifts are just basically a Doppler shift of light. Good. So the size of the shift will depend on the speed. Yeah? So if these molecules are moving very fast, you'll have a bigger shift, small, smaller shift. Good. So how do we get to mechanics? Well, everything is connected. So these molecules, are, I mean, in physics, all we know how to model is springs, really. So everything's connected by springs. And if you imagine like a very stiff spring will oscillate quicker and a soft spring will oscillate slower. So that's a simple explanation of that. So depending on how fast these are oscillating will tell us how stiff the material is. So in other words, if you get a big shift, you have a stiffer material. If you have a smaller shift, you have a less stiff material. Also, so this may be, I don't know if there's any particle physicists here, will make sense as well. If these phonons, well, these acoustic modes, I call them phonons now already, um, if they actually only live for a very short time, if they decay very quickly, the peak width will also increase, just like the lifetime of a, um, if the lifetime of a particle is shorter, the peak width increases. So basically, the width can actually also tell us the viscosity. So we can get an elastic property and a viscous property by just measuring the scattering of light with no label, just shining a laser on our sample at one point with essentially diffraction limited resolution. Okay, so how can we measure this? So obviously you need special spectrometers to measure this because these shifts are tiny. And so we can build certain spectrometers. So we, these are actually quite elaborate things to build. They take an optical table, although we're getting smaller and smaller. And we do have actually quite a compact one already. You need something to get rid of the elastic light because we're so close to this elastic scattering and we need to remove this. And we need some software to analyze this. And basically then it's not too hard to build a high throughput confocal setup where you can pretty much measure everything in 3D. And we've got several of these now. What can you measure? So people have measured all kinds of things. We know there's biofilms, the hair mechanics, that's also interesting. Teeth, obviously, you're interested in the stiffness there. In ophthalmology, it's already in the clinic, so that's actually, you know, you might even get to, get to have that applied to you. Um, of course, for various diseases, where you can imagine a change in mechanics. Um, in cell biology, we have a lot of cell biology applications in development. In development, you actually also see changes in the balloon shift, and there's a lot of various applications and some reviews you can look at here. But what are we really measuring? Okay, so what, what's different about the mechanics that we measure with brilliant scattering is the following. Firstly, the spatial scales probed. So we're measuring these, I, I told you we're measuring the scattering of these acoustic waves. Now these waves are about 100 nanometers in wavelength are the wave vectors we're measuring. They decay about over about a micron, depending on the material. This is an awkward size in biology. It's, from a physics perspective, it's beautiful. You can imagine resonances and all this. But from a biological perspective, this is annoying because you have structures that size. And you know, if you have a structure the size of your wavelength, we all know what happens. So that needs, that's 
important to consider this, this scale because that's what you're going to need to average over if you're going to actually try and model anything. The time scales. Because we're measuring at gigahertz frequencies, these one, uh, one wave number um, frequency shifts, actually at gigahertzes, these waves are actually extremely fast. They're gigahertz frequency. So we're measuring a mechanical property basically a billion times faster than you would by just poking something. So this is like jumping into a swimming pool from the top of the Eiffel Tower, not that dipping your toe in. So all viscoelastic materials, of course, they get stiffer as you go high in frequency. So you're always going to have values that are in gigapascals, which are much larger than what you would expect if you measure in another way. Another thing, these vibrations, they're isentropic, meaning they're, they have constant entropy and constant temperature. So you're not actually moving anything. They're just occurring, yeah? So this is very different from what you get if you poke something, because every material that I know of basically has a different engineering and true modulus, meaning that if you poke it, it's going to change its properties. It's going to be slain dependent to some extent. This is not going to be relevant here. Finally, the modulus is also very different. So basically, you're measuring an acoustic wave, so if you imagine an acoustic longitudinal wave, you don't have any vibrations perpendicular. So you're very sensitive to compressibility. So if something's very incompressible, has a lot of water, you're going to have a high modulus here. So these are like key differences that you need to interpret this. So what can this even be useful for? OK, from a fundamental perspective, these time scales, these spatial scales, these are directly relevant for phase transitions. So these are the time scales at which phase transitions occur and which obviously are very interesting biology, but it's not really mechanics per se. It's a gigahertz frequency phenomena because that's basically the frequencies at which you have the hydration shells and which you have the molecules interacting over extended distances. So for that, we can use brillant spectroscopy to actually get something very useful because obviously a lot of our body from the nucleus to all kinds of uh, different organs rely on phase transitions to actually take on shape. In hard materials, I'm not going to go into detail here, the frequency shift um, the high frequency regime is actually very similar to the low frequency regime. That is because hard materials, they have very slow relaxation times, and if you measure high frequencies or low frequencies, you more or less have very comparable things. So we can actually use it, we've got projects on teeth and bones, which actually, where we really can say something exactly about the mechanics that you actually normally feel. Traumatology, high shock, you can imagine that's relevant. Explosions, anything which has a very high frequency would, have, would be useful. Outside of the medical field, there's, um, because we're uh, sensitive to exactly these molecular interactions, they can measure the salinity of uh, water. So there's actually satellites that shine beams down in the ocean and measure how salty water is and how, what the temperature of water. And of course, in geology, it's also very interesting because we're interested in the propagation of P waves and uh, S waves uh, to understand effect. But everything I've shown you so far actually largely relies on it being a proxy to something else. This is absolutely fine. I mean, especially from a medical perspective, we often just want to say, like, A is different from B, yeah? And if we can diagnose a disease based on a value being different than another value, that's fine. So all these applications are, to a large extent, um, relying on it being a proxy. OK, so now let me get to dynamic structure. I've got two minutes, and I don't know how I'm going to do this. Um, I'm going to try. OK, so what do I mean by dynamic structure? So static structure. If we have static structure, we basically assume that something will have the same structural shape and on a scale longer than the perturbation that we apply. Yeah? So we can imagine like a mattress. It has a certain static structure, which gives it its shape and its mechanical anisotropy. The side will be different than the other. So all biologic, a lot of bi biology uses this in a lot of cases. You know, it creates scaffolds and gives it shape. So by dynamic structure, I want you first to imagine a liquid. Um, everything is just moving around. Now we can imagine some kind of phase transition, some kind of phase state which changes and gives it temporary structure. But that's not really what I mean by dynamic structure. So this is a very fundamental process. It can give it temporary structure, but it, um, it doesn't give you dynamic structure per se. What I want you to imagine first is to me just slowing down time to a complete stop. Yeah? So this is the same as cooling something down. Everything is still. Yeah? Now I speed it up slowly. Yeah. So what I'm going to get is I'm going to get the individual vibrations of bonds, and this is basically the Raman signal that we were talking about earlier. And if I speed it up a little more, then I get these collective vibrations. Now these collective vibrations, basically they extend over these extended uh, distances. This is exactly what we're talking about with the Brillouin spectroscopy, and they will actually form uh, a connection between large-scale 
uh, larger scales. Now, imagine these vibrations, they're going to be different in different directions, depending if you have a different composite structure. So imagine a couple of rods, the vibrations, the sound speed will be faster along the rods than perpendicular to them. Now remember, we're talking at really high frequencies. So at high frequencies, everything is solid. I put a little bit of salt in my liquid, and it becomes a different kind of liquid completely, completely different mechanical properties. So I do not need a solid structure to create a dynamic structure. And that's the whole point, and I think I'm out of time. And I didn't even get to the main point, but that's OK. I hope you learned something. Um, you can have a dynamic structure entirely from having a different solute concentration in different regions. So if you have an, uh, an anisotropic distribution of, so of some kind of solute or even soft structures, you can create a different acoustic property in different directions, and you can create this dynamic structure. And the point is that biology is probably using this, and we have like I've got three very good examples where it is, but I don't think we have time. Do we have to finish now? Or? Give us an example. Give you an example. OK. So we actually basically measure, we can measure the brilliant spectrum from all different directions sequentially. And what we probe is we probe a different um, part of this so-called stiffness tensor. And this gives us information on the mechanics in different directions. So we basically built a setup which can actually measure this simultaneously from all directions at the same time. And one example is going to be the cell nucleus. So we actually measured a lot of different systems. So the cell nucleus is a basically, I'm just going to go front here. It's for all, for all essential purposes, it's a noodle soup. Yeah? So you have a warm noodle soup with noodles, which is basically the chromatin, moving around in some coordinated manner. And with brilliant spectroscopy, we can be sensitive to this noodle soup's mechanics, even though it's extremely so soft and essentially like a liquid. So what we actually see in the nucleus is we see two different anisotropy motifs, where, um, where basically we can see something that looks like a transverse isotropic material and an orthotropic material, so like with two degrees of symmetry. And these seem to fluctuate in time and in space. So what you see is we define something called a uh, fractional anisotropy, which is basically a measure of how anisotropic the material is. And we can also define the direction of the anisotropy. And what we do is we actually can correlate this with the state of chromatin itself. So whether chromatin is more of a solid state, a more compact state, or more of a uh, stretched out state, um, we can do basic fluorescence studies where we can correlate this anisotropy directly with how compact chromatin is. And here's further studies that actually show this. And it also correlates with nucleus size. So this is actually really interesting, is that if a nucleus is elongated in one direction, the net anisotropy will be more in that direction. If we do spatial maps, we see there's some kind of correlated order over space. So this is an alignment parameter that we define, which basically tells you how closely this anisotropy is aligned. We measure this at different points, and it seems to change quite significantly. But this is the origin of that is actually revealed if we just park our beam at one spot in the nucleus, and we look how the anisotropy fluctuates. So here I plot the fractional anisotropy parameter, and it oscillates at a characteristic time of about 0.1 hertz. So it's about 10 seconds. Now this is really interesting because there's, people believe there's a solid gel transition happening on those time scales. And we also see the same transition actually in the fluorescence signal, which shows us how chromatin is condensed. So we have a, nucle a chromatin basically going in and out of a condensed state at 0.1 hertz. Now we can map this really fast. I'm not going to go into the details of the setup, but I'm just going to show you these results. And we can actually do these maps where we, where we calculate the local directors. This is the direction which it's more anisotropic in. And you see these funny patterns, and you can make out some kind of order in them. And these are not random patterns. If you have a good imagination, you can see something. But what we can calculate is how these patterns scale. Is there any order in this system at all? And why is this interesting? Because if it's ordered, as in a solid, then you would imagine some constant alignment. If it's liquid, you wouldn't, mind any, wouldn't expect any alignment. You'd expect an exponential scaling of this order parameter that you can calculate. Meanwhile, if it's something in between, then you would expect an algebraic scaling. So this would be if the system exists in a critical state. So you can do a million experiments like this and get some statistics, and you'll see it fits both an algebraic and an exponential scaling. Both of these fit our results reasonably well. And when the cells die, the scaling collapses completely. But what's interesting is if you take values 
whether this fractional anisotropy is large and ones where it's small and you split all your cells into two batches, you'll see the ones with a high fractional anisotropy do show an algebraic scaling uh, compared to an exponential scaling. So what this would suggest is that those cells exist in a critical state. Basically that they're in between a liquid and a solid, they're basically a, a quasi nematic liquid crystal in those states. And this is directly correlated to the condensation of chromatin. So I could go on, but I'm not, not going to keep you any longer because I'm already over. Um, and with that, I'd like to, I'm going to stop. That basically the, um, we, we have shown like in the nucleus, you have this oscillation between the anisotropy and that you can measure this dynamic structure in actually living cells. We've actually sort of seen this also in plant cell walls and we've seen it in muscles as well. Um, and we can access this regime quite well.